Welcome to Villains Too Stupid To Win. We're back with another big bad from the DC Universe. It's time to shed some light on the League of Shadows from the Dark Knight Trilogy. Before the Kryptonians almost destroyed the world with dubstep, before Murder Man conjured an irrational beef with Superman because alien invaders messed up his building, before frenetic tech bro who claimed to be Lex Luthor got over his daddy issues by making the tough jocks fight each other, we had the comic book adaptation benchmark in the form of the Dark Knight trilogy that apparently absolutely no one at DC Studios paid any attention to whatsoever. Welcome to the Nolanverse, a film series that manages to cast off the yoke of previous Batman misfires, but that doesn't mean there isn't stupidity to be found here, and no one proves that more than the primary villains of the franchise, the League of Shadows. Based on the League of Assassins in DC Comics, the League of Shadows diverged so much from the source material they're now regarded as their own distinct entity, which is great because now I don't need to feign some enthusiasm for delving into 50 year old comic books. The League is an ancient secret order of morally dubious vigilantes who spend most of their time twiddling their thumbs waiting for society to worsen, only to emerge from the shadows to tear down those civilizations that have surrendered to criminality, corruption, decadence, or whatever other arbitrary judgments the League throws around. Supposedly a selfless effort to restore the natural order, punish humanity for our shortcomings, and create a semblance of true justice. They mainly do this by killing millions of innocent people, and if that didn't convey their malevolence enough, they even gave their organization an evil sounding name. The League claimed to be responsible for a range of historical events, from the sacking of Rome to the Black Death and the Great Fire of London, the latter two occurring so closely together you'd think they'd give their schemes a bit more room to breathe. 80,000 people had already died from plague the previous year in London. It can be argued the Great Fire actually helped purge the city of its plague infested rats and fleas. Kinda shot themselves in the foot with that one. And I'm not exactly sure how killing a small small handful of people while making a hundred thousand homeless is a sound way of decreasing criminality. The League citing these events as among their successes. Okay, if you say so guys. In modern times, they've migrated their activities from the old world to the new, now with an irrational fixation on Gotham City, a corrupt, crime-ridden New York facsimile filled with a typical assortment of cosmopolitan weirdos. And no greater among them than the League's arch nemesis, Bruce Wayne, a Bateman turned Batman. Man, a different breed of vigilante with a severe case of strep throat who spends his nights going around yelling at people. He must have friends. Not to mention his serious neck issues. This guy would probably take himself out without the League's intervention, yet he'll somehow still prove too much for them. But then again, between Ra's al Ghul's god complex and muddled ideology, Talia's abandonment issues, Bane's pain disability, and platform shoes, it's not like these guys aren't without their issues. And so we follow the modern League in their vendetta against Gotham. And unsurprisingly, despite having centuries to prepare, their schemes are as misguided as ever. Point 1. The League Creates Their Greatest Enemy so our journey begins with a young Bruce falling down a hole and having a few bats flutter around harmlessly, resulting in a lifelong phobia that has a catastrophic outcome pretty much immediately, getting the fear hard at a showing of… bats? Leading to one of Gotham's richest yet most defenseless men deciding to leave via the dodgy alleyway exit, proving that money and intelligence don't necessarily correlate. So inevitably Wayne's parents are gunned down by a rabid Gotham crim, and poor billionaire orphan Bruce just never got over this. Returning from college still salty and with revenge on his mind, but robbed of his goal by one of Falcone's goons. Both Rachel and Falcone suggesting he needs to check his privilege for a while, so he takes off on a misguided junket in an effort to understand the criminal mind. Apparently this mostly involves jacking his own TVs, getting caught immediately, and fighting with their mates in the slammer in Bhutan. Until Henry Ducard, definitely not Ra's al Ghul, recognizing a potential recruit and even possible successor, turns up looking completely conspicuous claiming he comes from a secret organization, delivering a vague tirade about justice and the nature of criminality. 
presumably bribing the prison officials for this little liaison and securing Wayne's release, immediately casting doubt on the league's definition of justice, taking up an invitation to join them in their not-so-secret mountain hideaway, receiving another red flag the second he comes through the door in the form of a brutal hazing ritual, and it didn't even seem to matter that he brought them their drugs. Once Raz begins Bruce's training montage in earnest, you'd be forgiven for thinking it occurred over a few evenings but apparently represents many months if not years which would surely be more than enough time for Raz to understand that his new protege probably isn't league material. More than that, he has the potential to become a powerful enemy, for the same reasons he was an attractive prospect in the first place. His financial assets, his networking potential, his genius, drive and commitment to achieving justice. And now they've taught Bruce a litany of new skills that will not only help him combat criminality but the League of Shadows themselves, including new martial arts styles, the arts of stealth and deception, and the value of theatricality. Yeah, three buttons is a little 90s, Mr. Wayne. And perhaps most importantly, Raz teaches him the key to conquering his greatest fears. But despite all that awesomeness, the league being all shadowy, they have to end his training on a bit of a downer. Forced to endure a bad trip, dumped in the least chill environment possible. I can't take it anymore, it's all too much. The walls are closing in. Blah, blah, blah. Then pressured to execute an unconvicted supposed murderer. After that sequence of events, I wouldn't want to do anything but bail. Bruce coming to the obvious realization that murdering people to defeat criminality is illogical, hypocritical and immoral. Raz pushing him even further away when his stand-in reveals their plans to destroy Bruce's home city. After all this time, Raz failing to recognize that Bruce won't be keen on this at all. His entire reason for going on his criminal exodus was so he could save Gotham, not destroy it. Not to mention the fall of Gotham would also greatly diminish Bruce's wealth and privilege, and therefore his power and the basis from which he intends to fight crime. At the very least, the League could have kept this part quiet until Bruce was well indoctrinated. So in clear ideological opposition to the League and given no choice but to join or die, a relatively inexperienced Bruce takes out the entire League of Shadows HQ and many of their minions with little more than a hot poker, allowing us to revisit one of the most obscure of villainous shortcomings, a woeful lack of fire safety. In the League's case, they've got naked flames blowing around directly below their massive gunpowder store. Bruce sassing the two big bads fairly easily, and a sizable group of ninja frat bros running off screen to get exploded somewhere. Where are they? Mr. Ghoul left in the care of some locals while Bruce heads back to Gotham. We've barely even got started and he's almost wiped them out. Peace has cost to your strength. Victory has defeated you. The League ultimately empowering and inspiring a man who would go on to become their greatest enemy and the ultimate foil against their plans. Point two, their unnecessarily complicated plans rely on their adversaries making uncharacteristic errors. So after Bruce gets back from grinding the Dark Fraternity just enough to get some of their skills and items but not far enough to affect his standing with other factions, he returns to a Gotham riddled with crime and corruption in an even sorrier state than when he left. Mob boss Falcone more entrenched than ever with his corruption extending to all areas of the Gotham justice system. So after Bruce re-establishes himself at Wayne Enterprises, he starts the prep work for some bat related shenanigans, inspired by the League's ideas even going so far as to utilize their bladed gauntlets in his bat suit, but naturally he makes them even more effective. So armored up and in peak physical and mental form, Bruce gets busy messing with Falcone's drug importing business, eventually figuring out that him and Dr. Crane are in league with a shadowy organization. And you guessed it, it's, it's the League of Shadows. Taking advantage of Falcone's greed, they use him to smuggle in a weaponized hallucinogen with Crane distributing it into the water supply. The trouble is, Crane has been spraying around a concentrated form of said hallucinogen, so he's slowly losing his shit, eventually forcing Batman to take a hit, giving him the opportunity to figure out an antidote, and thanks to it being derived from the blue flower, exposing the League's involvement as well. 
Crane and his lackeys apparently taking a bit too much influence from their employers. Looking to cover up their activities by splashing accelerants around, then witless goon number one is trying to see in the dark with his lighter. But Crane is even more reckless, lighting Batman on fire and somehow not blowing them all up. Thankfully, despite dodging that, he's soon given a taste of his own medicine. So with Falcone and Crane incarcerated, the League are forced out of the shadows to implement the final stage of their plan. An obvious reveal is obvious, it turns out generic Asian monk warrior guy wasn't Ra's al Ghul at all. It was Henry Ducard all along. So guys, when it comes to preserving your anonymity, we can do better than Mr. Ghoul. Be sure to keep your browsing locked down with Atlas VPN. A virtual private network secures all of your online data, protecting you from hackers, identity thieves, malware, third-party monitoring, and other online threats. No matter what device you're using, with Atlas VPN, you can browse, stream, and connect with confidence knowing that your data is encrypted end-to-end. -end. And with just one account, Atlas can protect all of your devices, even if you're using them simultaneously. As well as keeping all your data private and secure, Atlas VPN also offers a range of other features such as the ability to bypass internet censorship and geographical restrictions, giving you the final say over your browsing experience. When I've run out of stuff to watch on Netflix, I can just switch my geographical location, and suddenly I have access to a far larger entertainment library. So guys, be sure to grab the summer deal using the link in the video description below, because now Atlas VPN Premium is just $1.83 per month plus 3 months extra for free, and that's with a 30 day money back guarantee. Protect your privacy and get all the benefits of Atlas VPN for that ridiculously low price. That's Atlas VPN Premium for just $1.83 a month plus 3 months extra for free. So check out this limited time offer by clicking the link in the video description below. Surprisingly, after the firestorm of their mountain base, the League seemed to have enough frat bros left to implement the final stage of their plan. Releasing all the prisoners from Arkham Asylum, they then intend to vaporize the hallucinogen in the water supply using a microwave emitter stolen from Wayne Enterprises, with the hope that this will cause Gotham to tear itself apart, exposing their presence to Bruce for no other reason than an act of pointless personal revenge, setting Wayne Manor ablaze and abandoning an unconscious Bruce. So that's what that feels like. But at least when Bruce did it, he chose to leave Raz alive. A geriatric butler saving Bruce after sneaking up and pummeling one of these supposedly elite ninja assassins. So while Bruce gears up and takes a breather, the shady boys just need to get the microwave emitter under Wayne Tower, where it will be perfectly positioned to vaporize all of Gotham's water. Yet despite Raz bragging about the League infiltrating every level of Gotham society, apparently smuggling the emitter directly under Wayne Tower just isn't an option. No, they've got to unnecessarily complicate things by switching the thing on right now just for fun and then take it to the tower via train, exposing the full extent of their scheme earlier than necessary, giving Batman and his allies every chance to stop them. And sorry, did I say the henchmen were back? Because they just as quickly disappear at Ra's insistence, leaving him to complete this task alone. Where are they? At this point, he knows that Bruce is alive and well, he just left him with a paltry four dudes to take out, seemingly forgetting his arch nemesis bet their entire goon legion once already. You know how to fight six men, we can teach you how to engage 600. Not to mention the guy has grappling tech and is adept at scampering over rooftops and gliding to the areas below. I think a bit of extra muscle on this train ride wouldn't go amiss. But then again, Raz seems content to go down with Gotham. My fate, however, lies with the rest of Gotham. Hopefully he's got a succession plan in place. You wouldn't want a bunch of crazies getting control of the league. Then everyone loses their minds. Bruce giving Raz the ultimate lesson in minding his surroundings. This supposed paragon of goodness and justice delivering us a good bit of poetic justice when his train wreck of a plan ends in a literal train wreck. Even within chaotic systems, there is a pattern of limited predictability. The now leaderless league left to scurry back into the shadows for a time. It's not a joke, please leave. And then we had Batman 2 The Dark Knight in which absolutely nothing noteworthy happened, moving right along. I'm not wearing hockey pants. A new variant of the League of Shadows re-emerging in The Dark Knight Rises, now under the apparent leadership of Bane, a psychotic beefcake who would be in agony if not for the constant supply of drugs he's huffing. 
So when did the nut take over the nut house? A miracle anaesthetic that relieves his pain, increases his pain tolerance in general, while also making him resistant to exhaustion. That's right, he's basically a high functioning crackhead. Though the league may have had a bit of a reskin, they continue to fixate on Gotham and their plans remain just as flawed and convoluted. But now more than ever, they seem completely reliant on the good guys making poor decisions. But that's only when they're not helping them directly. So Bane and co are running a new Gotham infiltration campaign and if you thought spraying around drugs and unleashing all maniacs was attention grabbing, well the new league's plans are even bolder. Bane gets started with a bit of mid-air hijinks, letting himself get captured by the CIA alongside this Pavel guy, then orchestrating a plane crash and pumping Pavel's blood into a marginally Pavel looking body to make it seem like they all died in the crash. So much for dental records and hair samples, huh? Anyone who's watched those terrifying plane crash shows knows that these air crash investigator types are usually relentless bloodhounds of truth and justice, and probably even more so when they're working for the CIA. And you know what guys? Well, I think some components of this crash scenario are going to look just a tad suspicious. Thankfully for Bane, these air crash investigators seem to have been incompetent. After that whole thing, Bane sets up camp in Gotham, and fittingly, they've gone from the mountaintop to the filthy sewers where they belong. Bane, who was born and raised in a prison pit, apparently preferring the comfort of dark holes. And it's not like this sewer base is even good at concealing their presence, because they're enlisting the local street rats and then killing them for pointless reasons unknown, letting the culverts deal with the bodies, drawing the attention of one of Gotham's more discerning cops. Might be time to get some fresh air, start paying attention to the details. They're just lucky Batman is currently MIA after the events of the Dark Knight, and a physically and mentally broken Bruce shouldn't be much to overcome. And so, in a similar manner to their predecessors, they inspire their greatest enemy to get out amongst it, triggered by Catwoman showing up to steal Bruce's fingerprints at the behest of this Daggett guy who of course in turn is being manipulated by Bane. Promised by the League that his company would end up absorbing Wayne Enterprises, let's see how that plays out for them. So they decide to off Catwoman because loose ends, even though she knew little of their operation, forcing her to sick the cops on them in an act of self-preservation. So now they have another dangerous animal-themed anti-hero to count among their enemies. At this stage, they seem to be collecting them. When can we expect Bane to start wearing a bear suit? At this point, I'd set you up with a chimpanzee if it brought you back to the world. So Gordon chases some gunmen into the sewers but ends up getting jumped by Bane's thugs, who for some inexplicable reason think it's a good idea to take the police commissioner into the heart of their secret sewer base. And you brought him down here. Bane is at least able to recognize that an error has occurred, but his shitty performance coaching shows us just how far the league's workplace culture has deteriorated. I already suspected Bane had taken a bit of influence from Darth Vader, with his mask, audible breathing, and voice modulation, but now it seems all but certain. Be careful not to choke on your aspirations. That's a lovely, lovely voice. Bane bullying, humiliating, and killing his men without warning. Good. Why on earth would anyone want to sign up with this outfit? And while he's busy strutting around all aggro, lording over Gordon, the commissioner slips away with all this golden intel. Bane taking it out on his man, but really, since he was present as leader, Gordon's escape is all on him. Thankfully, Bane is nearly ready to implement the main stage of his plan, announcing his presence to Gotham by taking over the stock exchange, using Bruce's fingerprints to tank all his investments, bankrupting the guy. But it's weird that despite this being a high-profile criminal activity, those trades were processed immediately as legitimate. Luckily for Bane, it's not just the air crash investigators who are dropping the ball. And really, fingerprints are all that's required to process all those trades? Two-step verification would be better than this. And it's not like the cops will be able to stop them, they've got roadblocks with convenient little motorbike ramps. But have no fear, because the bat is back and he's got better toys than ever. Though unfortunately, the local boys in blue still think the guy is a cop killer. So they completely give up on getting the men who just shot up the stock exchange and focus exclusively on getting the bat. Who do you want to catch on? 
some robber or the son of a bitch who killed Harvey Dent? The scheme to bankrupt Bruce, designed to rob him of his position at Wayne Enterprises and make him believe Dagon and Bane are in cahoots, manipulating him into giving control of his company to this random lady, a Wayne board member who invested in Bruce's clean energy project and has recently been flexing her philanthropy. That obviously means she's good. Of course. And so, one of the world's foremost private detectives hands over total control of his company and finances to a woman he barely knows, failing to even give her the standard background check. Catwoman gets all the scrutiny, yet with the so-called Miranda who he's about to give total control of his life, he's making huge assumptions. I assumed your family was wealthy. And oh no, Miranda is actually Talia Al Ghul. Yes, as in Raz Al Ghul, the true power behind this variant of the League, choosing to obscure her identity in a similar manner to her father. So they bet everything on this little undercover scheme that should have had very little chance of success. I must caution you both. My tactical analysis does not bode well for the success of such a mission. Bruce was just as likely to dispute the legitimacy of the fraudulent stock trades and retain his position, or get one of the Wayne loyalists to take over. His handing over control to Talia was less than a given. In fact, it's a pretty poor business decision in general. Bruce's free energy project had already scuttled the company and Miranda's primary skills are around fundraising for charity. So with Talia firmly in control of Wayne Enterprises, Bane kills Paul Wee Daggett the second his usefulness ends. Even before he he was director Krennic, dude still wasn't getting his dues. My achievement! Ditching the body of this well-known captain of industry in a nearby dumpster, immediately drawing attention to the dodgy construction work he'd recently rubber stamped. They could have left him anywhere in their sewer base and it would have been better than this. Though admittedly, that may have been part of their campaign to lure in the bat. So with all this heat flying around, a cranky, totally unprepared Batman heads down for a brawl with Bane and his entire organization alone. We didn't even get our Batman training montage, it's like Bruce wants to die. Catwoman was technically present, but she was only shown him where to go. Her betrayal ends up being inconsequential. Batman offered a fair play one on one with Bane, which to be honest is probably the best scenario he could have hoped for. No point wasting his energy on all the minions first. Unfortunately, this half-strength, half-wit bat guy gets absolutely pummeled. Aside from his pocket EMP, failing to utilize any of his gadgets or weaponry and not consistently targeting Bane's only obvious weakness. And he even seems to be under the illusion that a few pop-pops might be enough to do in this psychotic veteran mercenary. And no offense, but you got something bigger in that belt! Bane finishing his big Batman beatdown by breaking the back of an already broken Bruce. And just to add insult to injury, they then steal most of his bat toys from his corporate man cave, including his unboxed duplicates. The nerve. All of the necessary hardware they'll need for the next insane phase of their plan. Detonating a heap of explosives, moron Daggett help them lay around the place. Killing the mayor and isolating the city from the rest of the world. Holding Gotham to ransom using a nuclear device fashioned from Wayne's fusion reactor, a comparatively puny 4 megaton nuclear bomb which seemingly has no advantage over a regular nuke other than there being less fallout. So in other words, this bomb will do less harm than a regular fission 4 megaton device. Is that meant to be good? But then again, even Bruce seems to operate under the delusion that his reactor represents some sort of new danger to humanity, depriving us of an energy source that would probably save an untold number of lives. Someone will figure out a way to make this power source into a nuclear weapon. You would think the League would have the resources, expertise and infiltration skills to just swipe a regular nuke, or perhaps even build their own if they kidnapped the right people. But instead they chose a needlessly elaborate scheme to swipe this reactor, involving the kidnapping of Pavel, orchestrating a plane crash, relying on Bruce handing control to Talia and giving her the location of the reactor. There are just so many points of failure to this whole scheme, it shouldn't have worked at all. Sometimes. Sometimes things just go bad. But then I don't know if we can expect anything resembling logic when their ultimate goal is just to rule over Gotham for five months and then die along with everyone else when the bomb goes off. I see no persuasive evidence that a life like yours should be wasted simply because you are disgruntled. 
and apparently in a massive US city of 12 million there isn't anyone to stand in their way. No local army, air force, national guard and the like. Nope there's just a whole bunch of misguided cops who the league lures into the sewers and traps before they can even fire a shot. Apparently Batman isn't the only one at a low ebb of his powers. After Bane kidnapped the Wayne board members, Gordon making the idiotic decision to send almost the entire force underground in a city highly prone to criminal wackos. Get every available cut down there and smoke him out! Luckily Gord seems to recover his mental faculties, or rather he was gifted a getaway. The League's assassins going to cap him after it's already obvious something big is going down. So with Bane and co now the de facto rulers of the city, they get busy disempowering the old guard of Gotham, roughing up the rich people, outing Gordon's minor corruption, and even going so far as to release all the prisoners from Blackgate prison, reinforcing their ranks. Okay, but that sounds like a great way to to get shanked in the back. Meanwhile Bruce has been dumped in the pit, a hole of a prison in a nameless Middle Eastish country and the primary source of all of the neuroses afflicting the League of Shadows leadership. Back in the day a young Raz impregnated a warlord's daughter and was thrown on the pit for his trouble. And then weird country being weird, he was released while unbeknownst to him the pregnant daughter took his place down the hole. Wait is this where Ghoul got his warped sense of justice from? Bane, another former hole resident, proves that even an angry beefcake can have a soft interior, saving young Talia and protecting her against the other prisoners. Talia climbing out of the hole through sheer force of will and coming back with Daddy Raz to save Bane, who she has kept firmly in the friend zone ever since. That's right, even a little girl with inferior reach was able to pull off this jump. Somehow I don't think a guy who was adept at climbing, repelling and the like. Uh, spelunking. We'll have much trouble with this. Knowing Bruce doesn't fear death, Bane supposedly leaves him here as a further act of torture, choosing to satisfy his own sadistic tendencies rather than decisively ending Bruce's ability to mess with their schemes. This is an unnecessary indulgence. Instead, he gives his arch nemesis absolutely everything he needs to completely recover from his broken spine, make the jump and get back to Gotham to resume disruption of the League's affairs. Bruce has got his own personal doctor and physiotherapist down here. This guy Guy's literally been paid by Bane to keep Bruce alive, but he ends up doing a hell of a lot more than that. Going so far as to explain the details of Bane's most obvious weakness, highlighting to doofus Bruce where he should focus all his hits next time. The mask holds the pain at bay. So Bruce has got all this free time to skill up and work out and he's even got his own satellite TV with crystal clear reception, giving him a live feed of his city burning, educating him extensively on the Gotham situation and giving him all the motivation he needs to get the hell out of there. So after we finally get some training sequences, Bruce is ready to make the jump, ballsily making a no rope attempt like Talia before him and getting the job done. Now if someone could just tell me why one of these prisoners didn't just fashion a grappling hook out of a few prison shivs, attach it to a rope, climb up to the last safe ledge, throw it over the lip and simply climb their way out. Grapple obsessed Batman should have been all over that. Once he's out, we see there's a long pile of rope just sitting there, potentially allowing everyone to escape after just one of them makes the climb. Hell, it could go in with a stiff wind. And worth mentioning at this point, this prison pit is said to now be owned by Bane. So these are apparently all his personal prisoners that could escape by various means at any time. You have my permission to die. But delving into Bane's warped psychology, it would actually make sense that he might see escape from the pit as a rite of passage for anyone who dares to challenge him. Perhaps deep down he kind of wanted Bruce to escape and helped him along intentionally, which just makes this course of events all the more worse. So after months down the hole, Bruce sets off back to Gotham in good shape with all the insider motivation he needs to take on Bane and the League of Shadows. He's even got an army in the form of 3000 cops, but I'm not sure how much help they'll be. Unlike Bruce, they they wasted their time underground doing absolutely nothing except munch food and pass notes to each other. With Talia still pretending to be a good sort, she's sabotaging all of Gordon's ops and no one is putting together that she's the common denominator. Then Bane or Talia, whoever, decides that she's best kept near Bane in an effort to lure Batman in, which basically destroys all the sweet intel they were getting when she was undercover with the boys. The cops have also managed to pull finger, going from zero to a hundred with this 
ridiculous full frontal assault of the league occupied city hall. Thankfully the bat is there to provide some air support. And during the subsequent mass street brawl we finally get our Wayne vs Bane rematch. A rejuvenated Batman finally realizing that targeting Bane's mask with his weaponry is probably a good idea. A flustered Bane fumbling around with his breathing tubes and then poorly timing the activation of his rage mode. Batman delivering some poetic justice to a league big bad once again. Absolutely harassing Bane's mask with his league inspired gauntlets. Only saved by Talia's reveal followed by a massive exposition dump and some insight into her warped motivations which we'll look at more closely in the coming section. Since Talia hasn't been around to spy on them Gordon has found the bomb and blocked the detonator signal. So Miss Al Ghul can't kill everyone including herself. What a drag. Preferring to torture innocent people for no good reason whatsoever. They've drawn this thing out for as long as possible when they could have hit the button any time in the last five months and been done with it. How much damn time do you need to get off? Bane finally losing his patience and showing us that he's not a total pawn. Going against Talia's orders, deciding to kill Batman before the explosion can hit. Thankfully, enemy fury number two rocks up at just the last second and shells Bane into oblivion. Personally, I think I would have preferred him being kicked into a deep dark hole, Spartan style. He doesn't like that. Not one bit. So Talia is off to secure the bomb, ends up crashing and snapping her neck, previously rigging the reactor chamber to flood as a final act of malice, denying Batman and co the option of reinserting the reactor core and defusing the bomb, declaring victory in her final moments, seemingly forgetting that this bomb is mobile and Batman has an aircraft. But it's not like our good guys are ending the trilogy in a much better fashion, despite interacting with Batman personally for years. Dopey Gord is still in the dark about his identity until receiving an on-the-nose hint from the man himself. Something as simple and reassuring as putting a coat around a young boy's shoulders. Remaining blissfully unaware all this time despite there being numerous Batmobiles, a Batcopter and a Batbike all milling around. At this point it should be obvious that Batman has so much money behind him it couldn't be anyone else but Bruce Wayne. Then we've got this guy Robin who was smart enough to figure out Batman's identity but after being cut off on a bridge with a bunch of orphans decides that this would be an ideal place to endure a nuclear blast. What are you doing? Seemingly forgetting about the vast underground network of sewers nearby. I got 500 pages of tunnel records and a flashlight. But Batman can take some of the blame for this. He told Robin to gather up people and go across the bridge. But you need to get people across the bridge. Just before he tells Catwoman to blow this tunnel as an escape route. But the cannons have enough firepower to make a path for people. Which, to be honest, seems like a much more secure passage out of there for everyone. Thankfully the poor orphans are spared because Batman decides he's just gonna die anyway, heroically flying the nuke out over the ocean and apparently taking it on the chin. This, along with the truth around Harvey Dent being known, allowing the martyrdom of Batman, potentially galvanizing the city and finally allowing it to function without the need for a masked vigilante, and a final kick in the teeth for the League of Shadows. Shall I flog them as well? But hang on, there was that whole autopilot plot thread that went nowhere, hmm. After Bruce was declared dead, he eventually shows us what a mysterious bastard he truly is, turning up to flex his latest squeeze to his adopted father, knowing Alfred would be there due to a fantasy he once shared with him. Well at least Bruce is one for consistent payoffs, but it does feel a touch emotionally manipulative that he'd trust Alfred with his big Batman secret for years, but then this secret is too much for him until just now, and then Robin swoops into the Batcave and teases a weird Robin Man movie that mercifully wasn't to be. But let's get back to the main task at hand, we haven't covered all of the League's stupidity just yet. For the League like to talk a big game, but unsurprisingly their actions don't measure up to their beliefs. Point 3. The League is guided by a muddled, inconsistent ideology making their existence utterly pointless. So the main source of information about the League's beliefs naturally comes from Mr. Ghoul in Batman Begins, delivering us some insight into their sordid history of activities, their ideas around justice and their opposition to criminality, corruption and so called evil. Hatred of evil who wishes to serve true justice. Seeing themselves as a cleansing fire periodically arising to burn out the rot, supposedly an effort to restore balance and bring about true justice, clearing the way for better times. The League of Shadows has been a check against human corruption for thousands of years. 
years. Forest grows too wild, a purging fire is inevitable and natural. Seeming to believe that crime and corruption aren't natural components of human society. Yes, they haven't been paying attention at all. Crime, despair. This is not how man was supposed to live. But the trouble is, their activities indiscriminately target both evil people and innocents alike. And historically, they appear to have had little effect other than to increase the suffering of ordinary people. The League believing that the societies themselves have become impossible to rehabilitate and that everyone within is guilty by association. They also fail to define what exactly constitutes an evil person or even criminality, rubbishing traditional justice systems while also appearing to use their definitions of criminality to condemn people. This man is a murderer. This man should be tried. By whom? Corrupt bureaucrats? Well, sorry, but if we're looking to them for guidance, then almost everything the League engages in is highly criminal. And the evil they perpetuate on society puts them in the same category as history's most terrible mass murderers. They all had their bullshit reasons too. The League acknowledging that murder is wrong, yet not seeing themselves as guilty of the same. It probably goes without saying, but the League are astonishing hypocrites of the highest order and a force of malevolence at their core. The fact that there are petty criminals and murderers mercenaries in their ranks is the absolute least of their ideological problems. Resolving to use the tools of criminality to fight criminals, they engage in most of the activities they condemn. From lower level crimes to supporting crooked officials, business leaders, criminal gangs and other nefarious types. And then of course there's the genocide. As far as the League is concerned, the end justifies the means. But considering they've never achieved any lasting change, we're left to wonder what exactly they've accomplished other than to be more terrible than the those they hate. Criminals in this town used to believe in things. Honor. Respect. In Ra's League, he's convinced himself that the destruction of Gotham will save the world. It should be you standing by my side saving the world by acting as some sort of punitive example for the rest of us. Forgetting that punishment up to and including the death penalty is already a component of many justice systems, and there's no evidence it actually deters crime. Odds are Gotham's destruction would do worse than nothing to alter humanity's behavior. Crime must have a logical purpose. Raz seems so pleased with himself that he delivered such a poetic scheme as the means to Gotham's downfall. Then watch Gotham tear itself apart through fear. But honestly, getting everyone dangerously high, unleashing a bunch of crazies, and watching them all kill each other isn't as meaningful as he thinks. I'm pretty sure that would play out similarly no matter which city it occurred in. The required mental gymnastics become even more extreme once we discover that the League is mostly responsible for Gotham's sorry state. With Gotham we tried a new one, economics. Create enough hunger and everyone becomes a criminal. Manipulating Gotham's economy and massively increasing crime around the time of Wayne's parents, which was more or less the height of criminality in Gotham. So they created the very situation they then used to condemn Gotham. It's like they've created this problem city as a straw man to attack and justify their own existence. This also means the League is indirectly responsible for the deaths of Bruce's parents, and you chose this guy as your protege. The societal situation somewhat improving after the Wayne family murders. The other rich folk galvanized into saving their city through charitable and other means. Of course, that just wasn't enough for the pedantic League of Shadows. Here you are. Like, we're still at war. But with his last words, Raz seems to make a bit of a Freudian slip, unintentionally acknowledging that the League's activities are unjust. You were just an ordinary man in a cape. That's why you couldn't fight injustice and that's why you can't stop the strain. Well, I'm glad he finally came around, even if it is a bit too late for him. In their last moments, people show you who they really are. By the time of the Dark Knight Rises, Gotham is well on the mend. The events of the Dark Knight seen Harvey Dent held up as a phony martyr, Batman as a patsy, and the subsequent societal shift allowing Gordon and co to lock up many of the worst crimbs, destroying the hold organized crime once had on the city. What does it matter how they got this result? The end justifies the means, right? But these kind of meaningful gains count for nothing to the League of Shadows, especially now under Talia and Bane, who seem more ideological logically confused than ever, failing to pay any kind of proper lip service to justice. They seem only concerned with revenge against Gotham and Batman, satisfying their sadistic urges and finishing Ra's al Ghul's work. I honor my father by finishing his work. Seemingly in worship of a man who neither of them got along with. Bane was banished from the League and Talia beefed with her father over it. I could not forgive my father until you 
murdered him. You sycophantic suck-ups. Under Talia, the veil has been well and truly lifted. They're nothing more than a terrorist organization now. Though at least Bane is capable of admitting that what they're doing is somewhat evil. I'm necessary evil. They're so far gone that all of a sudden criminals aren't the enemy, they're the oppressed. Releasing all the prisoners from Blackgate Prison on a technicality when odds are they were all very guilty. Okay, admittedly it's all a bit of theatrics, part of their liberator shtick. But the fact remains that Ra's sight of the parole of Joe Chill is the prime example of the failure of Gotham's justice system. Criminals mock society's laws. You know there's better than most. Yet both Raz and Bane release more prisoners than any Gotham parole board or crooked bureaucrat could ever pull off. With Bane and Talia, we also get a look at what supposed justice would look like under the League. And predictably, it's extremely ugly. Singling out criminals and political dissidents alike and convicting them without trial, giving them two sentencing alternatives, both of which are death. Is this the better world the League had in mind? Thankfully, the League's deeply confused and horrific vision for human society wasn't to be. Batman and Gordon's brand of vigilanteism involving the circumvention and manipulation of Gotham's legal system proving far more effective at actually achieving real-world gains. If the League really wanted to destroy criminality, they should have considered other options. And don't worry guys, I wouldn't dare suggest social welfare or philanthropy to this pack of ruffians, even though Talia would obviously be very good at it. Why not use the League's resources to infiltrate the relevant crooked organizations and transform them or destroy them from within? There's a lot of potential for aggressive expansion. And if that's too much effort, you could always start assassinating irredeemable criminals and corrupt politicians. Shoot them. Shoot them all. It would all still be very immoral, but at least it would be far more ideologically consistent. But in saying all that, I think the League's talk of justice is just window dressing, a cover for motivations that are primarily emotional, even in Raz's case. <laughs> He's let his entire worldview be coloured by his time as a mercenary and the bad behaviour of one warlord, projecting his anger and thirst for revenge onto everyone. Investigating this case has given me a new respect for your inner struggle. Similarly, Talia and Bane had a rough upbringing to say the least. The League seems to be dominated by damaged, suicidal people lashing out at the world. Little <clears throat> group therapy sessions in broad daylight. This being part of the reason Bruce was such a good target for Papa Ghoul. Guy dresses up like a bat, clearly has issues. <laughs> Taking advantage of his trauma, even going so far as to talk a lot of smack about Thomas Wayne, in an obvious effort to supplant him as father figure. Your parents' death was not your fault. It was your father's. Anger does not change the fact that your father failed to act. It was stronger than your father. I'm sure many of these fatherless brutes have been brainwashed in a similar manner. Though unlike Bruce, they're probably lacking the intelligence and insight to understand what they're doing is wrong. And our final criticism, but potentially most serious. Did the League forget along the way that they were meant to be a secret organization? The events from the past easily passed off as organic or naturally occurring incidents. But their activities in recent times would surely have destroyed their anonymity forever. Exposing them to levels of scrutiny that should make it impossible for them to continue. There's no going back. You've changed things. Forever. League of Shadows? More like the League of Light. But I suppose that doesn't matter so much when the League's leadership does everyone a favor and resolves to wipe out what seems like their entire organization. The League's long history apparently coming to an abrupt, pointless end. They should actually be thankful to Batman that any of the League meatheads survived at all. Though I'm doubtful they will have the skills and drive to pull off anything on the scale again. But as Raz suggested, If you devote yourself to an ideal, then you become something else entirely. So I guess we'll just have to see if even bad ideas can achieve immortality.